if you can pay cash for it. I mean, that's a little extreme. But you can do a lot better buying a used car and, until you kind of create your, your nest egg. Um, so anyway, uh, I think that's good advice for whether you go in business or, or not. But anyway, based on the experience we gained from renting homes, we started going to apartments. And uh, we didn't have much money, so we uh, raised money by getting investors to invest with us. And uh, um, I think we continued to emphasize the, and manage our apartments like our mother taught us, and that was to be very loving towards our tenants and kind to our tenants and maintain the properties well even if it required a delay in the cash flow, so to speak. Um, so we were quite successful. We were also uh, tried to be fair with our partners. If we had a loss, my brother and I uh, absorbed it. If we had a gain, we'd share it with our partners. So our partners never, even to this day, ever had a loss. And uh, as a result, it was pretty easy to get partners, <laughs> investors. So we were able to grow. and. It, one point we had, uh, I think, 440 different investors in their various properties. Now up to 1990 uh, came along, and uh, in the early 90s, Wall Street finally started to accept real estate. Prior to that, uh, it, it was just a, a difficult thing, and I, and the reason why is. Uh, real estate considered depreciation expense. So uh, it, it's very interesting that uh, in the early 90s, they started to catch on and add back depreciation to gap earnings. You know what I mean by gap earnings or the, the profit? They'd add back depreciation. And they called earnings from gap plus depreciation funds from operations. That was a brand new term. And, the, and as a result of that, real estate started to boom as a, as a Wall Street investment. Uh, now, the accountants didn't change the rules. Uh, gap rules are still the same, but, they, but uh, analysts just started to change how they uh, measured the performance of, of real estate companies. So uh, we saw this as an opportunity for us to take some of our apartments uh, and take some of our apartments and go public with, with them. And, uh, uh, which would benefit our partners, ourselves as well. But actually, we we started because we some of our partners wanted liquidity, and we couldn't figure out another way to do it. And that's uh, so we kind of fell into it. It took us two years of pounding the pavement in uh, New York to find the analysts uh, or find underwriters. Um, being from upstate New York, it was tough. We had one. Uh, Analysts tell us that upstate, that's as obsolete as the Erie Canal, you know, and <laughs> we don't want to invest in any properties in upstate New York. But finally, uh, a, uh, an investment banker was looking at my resume, and I had all my church work <laughs> on the resume, which they found very unusual. Now, most people don't put their church affiliation and, and uh, on their resume. But this guy turned out to be a Christian, and he, you know, that caught his attention. And he came, so he decided he sent some people to Rochester to check us out, and he liked what he found. And he thought, and the properties wasn't as bad as they thought they'd be either. So uh, then uh, that was the beginning. Uh, several months later, they put together a syndicate of a whole bunch of uh, investment bankers that, uh, that would underwrite our offering, and we went and raised uh, $100 million in 1994 uh, in, to go public. And uh, we were there on the opening day. It was a big, ex great experience. But anyway, that was only the beginning. Uh, during the following 10 years, we raised another $2 billion uh, as additional equity and uh, bought about $4 billion worth of apartments, which just is amazing. You know, this is a great country that you can do things like this. Uh, and we were, during those 10 years, we had great results. We were, uh, uh, our returns were in the top 1% of publicly traded companies uh, at, at that time. And so, you know, how do we do it? Um, some years we grew by 50% a year. And my brother or I will tell you that servant leadership was the key. Um, 
And I'd just like to talk about servant leadership uh, a bit. And um, I've got, uh, I won't keep you till 11. I mean, I've got probably enough stuff I could, but uh, I'd like to talk maybe about 10 more minutes and then ask for questions. If there's not any questions, I'll give you another 10 minutes. <laughs> but anyway, just I'd just like to chat with you about servant leadership. And you know, before I do, I've got uh, a plaque on my wall in my office that uh, is entitled The Paradox of, Paradox of Servant Leadership. And I've got some copies. Maybe we could just pass them around if you'd like. Um, you know, it, it is sort of a paradox when it comes to uh, most people's uh, opinion about servant leadership. Servant sounds like he's the guy at the bottom of the organization and, and uh, leader, he's the one at the top of the organization. So how could, how, how do those terms fit together? Well, you know, I think of a, uh, an example of a great servant leader. It's a, it's a football quarterback that takes the blame when his team loses and then gives his team the credit when they win. I mean, I think that's the great, great example um, that I, I often think of. Um, we learned and we taught our employees that servant leaders promote others and not themselves. They absorb pain like Jesus did rather than inflict pain. They give, give like Jesus did and they're not takers and they have humility. We had a training program where we'd bring in 18, as many as 1,800 uh, employees per year into Rochester for one week and our emphasis was on servant leadership. Um, you know, we believe that we have an inherent need to be servants, I think, uh, and to help others. I think that's the way God designed us uh, for good reason. You know, we, being a servant, we learn really from our own experience is, is an act of love, which is a very powerful force in an organization. It kind of releases people to, uh, uh, and empowers them. Uh, it helps them to express themselves. Their, their fear of criticism, you know, re it goes down. They be, then become more creative and more productive and so on. And uh, there's been lots of demonstrations about that, that organizations that nurture this kind of self-esteem uh, with their employees have a much higher level of performance. Uh, I could go on and give you some great examples, which I will if you, if you don't have questions. Um, but uh, let's see. Let me just skip over to a few pages. My notes here. Uh, I am still... The, co-chairman of the Board of Home Properties, uh, although I'm not active. I work about two weeks a quarter, a week before the board meetings, and a few days during the board meetings. Uh, that's most of what I do. They really don't need me anymore. We're not growing, actually. This is a very difficult time to grow. Um, this company is still very successful. Uh, I have a little fear. I wouldn't want to be quoted on this, but there's a little less em emphasis on servant leadership. That's a hard thing to maintain. And, in our culture today, uh, sad to say, uh, you know, we, we believe that the most important people are the ones at the bottom that are serving our customers, and it's very easy for the guy in the top office to get carried away with his importance, you know, and that's, uh, I'm not suggesting that's what happened, that's Ed Pettinello, who's now our, our president, but that's uh, pretty, pretty common today. Uh, 